Thank you everyone for joining us for today's GSA Fleet Desktop Workshop on Federal Fleet Management Regulations. Um, we are excited to host this session in conjunction with our partners over in the Office of Government Wide Policy. With that, I'm gonna turn things over to Connie Aaron. Hi everyone, um, my name is Connie Aaron. I work for GSA's Office of Government Wide Policy. And I want to thank Stacy and Eric Adams for helping out today with the workshop. And uh, thank you to Stacy for putting all this together and GSA Fleet for um, hosting us today. And so, like Stacy said, if you have a question, you can put it in the Q and A box. Um, let me go. So where are you today? You're at the desktop workshop for federal fleet management regulations, part two. Uh, thank you to those who came back uh, from last week. And like Stacy said, if you missed part one, that's okay. Um, you'll understand part two. Um, Cause I'm just gonna dive a little bit deeper into some things and then uh, go over some frequently asked questions that I get uh, in GSA's office of government wide policy. So this is just a slide to show what we did last week. In um, part one, we talked about uh, federal regulations governing motor vehicle management and how it fit into the overall framework of laws, regulations, and policies. And then we did a deep dive into 41 CFR 102-34, which is motor vehicle management. Now that is a government-wide policy and applies to all federal agencies. And um, the regulation is built in a manner from acquisition to disposal and the management in between. So it gives you what you need to know for government ride regulations on how to manage that vehicle. Today in part two, we're gonna dive deeper into 41 CFR 102-34 motor vehicle management. We're gonna go over and discuss 102-5, which is home to work transportation, i.e. can you drive your government vehicle home for official business? And then we're going to cover some frequently asked questions regarding official use, toll management, contractor use of government vehicles, and much more. So this is just a repeat slide from last week. When you're talking about regulations, um, what's unique about the federal fleet is the management of it is built into a regulation and a law, a bulletin. It could be an agency policy. It could be an executive order from the White House. It could be the Office of Management and Budget Circulars. A lot of decisions you make as fleet managers or as supervisors could uh, be derived from a comptroller general decision. And that's where at GAO, they decide how appropriated funds can be spent. Um, there's always your Office of General Counsel that's available for guidance. And then we have informed decision-making. So the informed decision-making I'm going to demonstrate that when I get into the FAQs later in the presentation. And um, you can see how a law, a regulation, or an agency policy all come together and help you make a decision on whether or not um, you're doing the right thing with a government vehicle. This is a repeat slide from last week just to show you the regulations that govern federal fleet management. Um, 41-101-26.501 is the purchase of new motor vehicles in the government. And that is, uh, it basically says GSA fleet is the mandatory source for purchasing uh, non-tactical vehicles in the federal government. GSA fleet, where you lease vehicles and where you purchase vehicles from is uh, regulated by 41 CFR 101-39. Um, we used to call it interagency fleet management systems. And then, oh gosh, sometime in the 90s, it changed to just GSA fleet. So um, if that's the regulation, but we are currently moving that regulation to the federal management regulation, the FMR. And so a lot of the operational information that was previously in a regulation has been migrated to GSA Fleet's customer leasing guide. If you haven't looked at the customer leasing guide, I highly recommend you do. If you lease a vehicle from GSA Fleet, please, please, please go read the leasing guide. 
Um, a lot of uh, answers to your questions will be found in that leasing guide. And if it's not, you can always contact your FSR for help. So we talked about 41 CFR 102-5 is the home to work transportation regulation. We're gonna go over that a little bit today. Last week was the dive into 41 CFR 102-34, motor vehicle management. And then, you know, replacement of personal property. That's 41 CFR 102-39. For vehicles, um, a lot of fleets use the exchange sale authority where if you have a vehicle, and it's ready for disposal, you sell it and use the proceeds to help fund the new vehicle. And in order to do that, it's part of exchange sale authority. So there's a regulation to cover that. And then I'm gonna go a little bit into why, why is she telling me about the federal travel regulation, the FTR? And if you're a DOD agency, it's called a JTR, the Joint Travel Regulation. So 41 CFR 3301, has a little bit of applicability to the management of government vehicles, and I'll show you that in this presentation today. So let's talk uh, names now. So we have GOV, government owned vehicle. We have agency owned vehicles. We have leased vehicles. We have rentals, and we have privately owned vehicles. So what's the correct term? So obviously, GOV is a government vehicle. Um, that could be applicable to anything, meaning agency-owned, commercial lease, or um, agency-owned. It's just a government vehicle. So you'll see, oh, what am I supposed to do with my GOV? That's just a generic term. So agency-owned vehicle, it means that the agency owns it. It's um, something that your agency procured, your agency manages. If you have agency-owned vehicles, you may use GSA Fleet Fed FMS to help manage that vehicle, or you may have your own internal uh, fleet management information system to manage agency owned vehicles. For leased vehicles, they can be commercial leased or from GSA Fleet. And what lease means, it has to, it's a vehicle that you're using for greater than 120 days. And since it's longer than 120 days, it requires government identification. And last week we learned what is the preferred spot for to identify a government vehicle is the US license plate, is the federal government license plate, is the preferred location for identification. And then there's rentals. Rentals are less than 120 days. They do not have to have government plates on them. GSA Fleet runs a short-term rental program that's been very successful for their customers to get vehicles uh, during peak season. Um, so it's for less than 120 days. If you are on official travel, the government-wide source for rentals for official travel is the uh, DTMO, Defense Travel Management Office, and that would be for civilian and military agencies. And, um, the rental car office always asks me to make sure you know what a GAR speed is. So if you're on official travel and you're renting a, a vehicle for official travel, confirm that the government administrative rate supplement are GARS, G-A-R-S. It's a $5 per day fee. It's listed on the rental contract. This ensures you're renting through the program and are eligible for the program benefits, including insurance. The GARS fee is intended to cover those costs incurred by the rental car company that are peculiar to doing business with the government. So the next time you're on travel, just look to see if you can see that GARS fee on your contract. So, and then POV, privately owned vehicle. GSA does um, issue out the reimbursement rates for privately owned vehicles, because there's different ones for different scenarios, like privately owned vehicles being used for official business, but a government vehicle is available, then that's a little bit lower reimbursement rate. And reimbursement rates cover everything. It covers your insurance, your fuel, your maintenance, any costs associated with your privately owned vehicle. And um, I think it might be 54 cents a mile right now. That's 
if a government vehicle is not available and you're using your POV. But don't quote me on that. Go to that website, gsa.gov backslash POV for the current reimbursement rate. So this is a question um, our office gets um, often, and it has to do with, can my agency mandate the use of a GOV versus a POV? Oh, somebody just correct me, it's 56 cents per mile. Thank you, Cynthia. I haven't looked in a while. Um, and so the, a lot of people come to GSA and say, can I, um, mandate the use of a GOV versus a POV. So this is what, if someone came to me, this is what I would tell you. Um, GSA does not regulate local travel. We only regulate official travel for civilian agencies. If you're a DOD agency, you're using the joint travel regulation. But um, for, so we don't, lo we don't regulate local travel. So your agency has internal guidance on what mode of transportation is authorized for local travel to conduct official business. And this is a government term, you just need to remember, um, mode of transportation. So you'll see that in the federal travel regulation, what mode of transportation has been authorized. Um, if you're on official travel, the mode of transportation authorized could be a POV, a GOV, it could be a train, it could be an airplane, um, it could be uh, a bicycle, it could be the mode of transportation. So those are the key words you're gonna look for in your local, in your internal guidance. What mode of transportation is authorized to conduct official business? Um, GSA does publish the GOV reimbursement rates. I just talked about that and thank you. It's 56 cents per mile if a government vehicle is not available. And if a government vehicle is available, the reimbursement rate is reduced for the use of the POV. So there is a question in here. I'm gonna, we, I have plenty of time built in this presentation for questions. So if I see the question pop up and Eric hasn't got to it yet, I'll ask. So what happens if the GRS rate is not on the agreement? Think specifically about Alaska and sometimes have to lease a vehicle short term because there are no rental agencies in a location. So the G, the GARS, the G-A-R-S rates, it's only for vehicles for official travel. Um, if you're on official travel, then you would talk to the Defense Travel Management Agency. Let me go into that. You would go to their website. It's DTMO. It's defensetravel.dod.mil slash site slash rentalcar.cfm. So you would talk to uh, DTMO about that. And if you have a question about the GSA fleet short-term rental program, you can reach out to GSA fleet about that. So getting back to GOVs versus POVs, some factors to consider when writing internal policy about whether you're gonna authorize the use of a GOV or a POV for local travel. Um, federal employees need to let their private insurance companies know they're using a POV for official business. It may require them to acquire additional insurance at their own expense. Why is it at their own expense? It's because the POV reimbursement rate covers insurance. So the government can't provide this additional coverage. Some other factors to consider is the use of POV advantageous to the government. Is another federal employee being dis place because a POV is being used, a POV and a GOV travel to a job site, which routinely would have been both employees and the GOV, has a cost benefit analysis been completed? Um, is the use of a POV being authorized due to an employee accommodation that cannot be met with the GOV? And are there any additional security issues if for the federal employee if a POV is authorized? So basically what we're telling you is that it is agency policy. <coughs> Excuse me. It's agency policy. 
you need to look at your own internal local travel regulations and guidance if you're doing this for local travel and then your um, official travel guidance uh, if it's not. If you're authorizing a POV for official travel, the federal travel regulation covers that. So this is, uh, we get this menace more than anything else. Can I use a government vehicle too? It's like, <coughs> excuse me, just add, put something in the blank. Can I use a government vehicle to um, have everyone in the office go to the funeral of a coworker? Can I use a government vehicle to drop my child off at daycare because it's right next to my office and I have home to work uh, authority? Can I use a government vehicle to uh, take a recruit to a NASCAR race? Um, can I use a government vehicle to bus everyone to Bush Gardens from the child care center on site? So as you can see, there's many uses of government vehicles. So official use means using your vehicle to perform your agency's mission as defined and authorized by your agency. So we always tell you to contact your agency fleet manager and or your general counsel office for your agency policy. The thing to remember of why official use is determined by the agencies, because there's so many missions out there in the federal government. The child care center that wants to take everyone to Bush Gardens for the day, and it's a uh, government-run child care center. I mean, that may be your mission to entertain children and take them to amusement parks during the day. So, but that's up to your agency to decide if that's um, a mission, part of your mission. So it's because of personal liability. And they just want to ensure that the government isn't liable for any unofficial use of a government vehicle. And they want to protect you as the employee, the driver, or the supervisor from any personal liability. You know, as a supervisor, you could say, sure, just go ahead and take those kids to Bush Gardens for today. But uh, wait, is that mission essential? Who's responsible? And so that's the reason why it may seem kind of like, wow, why can't I just stop and get lunch in the middle of the day in my government vehicle? It's because we're actually trying to protect your own personal liability. Um, it's because it's based on something called the Federal Tort Claims Act. And a lot of that is based on state uh, case law. And so what may be allowable in one state is not allowable in another state based on state case law. Um, something, a situation that has, I've seen in the past was um, someone who was a TDY and they decided to leave the hotel early to get breakfast on the way to the work site, but they left before their normal tour of duty back at the home office. To so say their normal tour of duty is starting work at 8 a.m., but they left the hotel at 7.30 a.m. to get breakfast. Um, in that particular state, they were considered uh, what's called out of scope. And then when they got into an accident, the driver was held personally liable for it. So that's just, you know, it's a very complicated issue. So when you're asking these questions about, can I use a vehicle for, these are the things you need to be thinking about. And it's not because the government doesn't want you to do things. They just want to protect the government's liability as well as your liability. Now, last week, I gave you the citation for incidental use. Um, incidental use is a taxable benefit reported to the IRS. Um, there's a publication for that. So there is a newer publication, but the link I have and the, I like the way this one's written. It hasn't changed that much, but this one's just written more towards federal. So I think I'm pointing you to a link of an older document. The information is still good. It's, that's what I'm told anyway. It's just, I like it's, it's format is better. Um, but incidental use, if you remember, if you were at the class last week, um, 
the the law about incidental use basically says your agency has to write a policy about incidental use of government vehicles because that's not something that GSA uh, regulates. So incidental use is using a vehicle for other than official purposes. I would consider stopping for lunch incidental use. So your agency should have a policy written about stopping for lunch in the middle of the day because uh, that's incidental use of a government vehicle. And then we always have to look at perception. How would a taxpayer view the use of the vehicle? Um, taxpayers don't like to see vehicles push uh, parked in a government vehicles parked at Bush Gardens. They don't like to see government vehicles parked at a NASCAR race. Um, but they're there for official purposes, but they don't realize that. So they will write in to everyone that will listen to them. Hey, I saw government vehicles being used improperly. And then you kind of tell them, okay, thank you. We appreciate you keeping an eye out. So just remember about the perception is how would a taxpayer view the use of the vehicle? So can I drive my government vehicle home for TDY purposes? I get this question a lot. So if I'm, it's the, uh, it's the night before official travel, and I want to take the government vehicle home and leave from my home to go on official travel. So what I want to say is it's an agency decision. The home to work regulation does not apply to employees on official travel. So official travel orders must authorize the GOV use and it must be advantageous to the government. So as a GSA employee, if I wanted to take a government vehicle home the night before travel, because it was gonna be advantageous to the government for me just to leave straight from my house and not have to go into the office and then leave the park for travel, which may, may, may make me late getting to the work site. Um, as a GSA employee, my supervisor has to approve it and we have to annotate it on our travel orders. And it's, um, it's all, that's how we approve it at GSA as a GSA employee. So you just need to check with your agency on how to get those approvals and if it's mission essential for you to do that. Um, you'll find when it comes to getting official use and incidental use approved in your agency, um, the, the terms are, it, it, they prefer advantageous to the government and it's not for the employee's personal convenience. So you'll see that a lot and responses back from your general counsel's office. Um, is it advantageous to the government and not for personal convenience? So right now, I'm just going through questions that I get a lot at vehicle.policy at gsa.gov. And um, I like to, if there's a definitive answer, I'll give it to you. But if it's an agency decision, I'm going to let you know. And then I'm going to, what we call informed decision making, go through what you need to consider when you're making that informed decision of whether or not to use the vehicle. So we get this question a lot. Can I drive my government vehicle in a foreign country? Many foreign countries do not recognize the U.S. government's self-insurance. If your agency is not covered under a SOFA, a status of forces agreement, or other diplomatic treaty which specifically addresses liability issues, then you need private insurance. The General Counsel's Office of GSA has determined that an agency must purchase additional liability insurance to operate vehicles in foreign countries. Another thing to remember is that the Federal Tort Claims Act does not protect federal employees outside of the United States. So remember, regulations aren't only to protect the government, but it's also to protect the employee. So if you're driving a vehicle outside the country, just remember your normal liability insurance is not there when you're in a foreign country. The Federal Tort Claims Act does not protect federal employees outside the United States. You should contact your agency's general counsel for assistance with this and your agency fleet manager 
to find out if additional insurance is required. If it's short duration trips, we've been advised to tell folks to consider commercial rentals that are inclusive of insurance in foreign countries. So if it's just a one-time thing, you're crossing the border just for one incident, um, and then coming straight back, then maybe a commercial rental might be more advantageous to the government. But if you are gonna do routine visits, then you should explore uh, private insurance to cover the vehicle. Can I transport a non-Fed in my government vehicle? So the government-wide regulations are silent on this, but your agency may have policy. Um, as I said earlier, there's so many missions in the federal government, there's no way GSA can regulate your mission. So, you know, can't, we get this question a lot, can a child be in a government vehicle? Well, if you are a military recruiter and you're picking up a high school student from the high school to take them to a testing center, you have a child in a government vehicle. If you run a uh, government-owned daycare center and you're taking the daycare kids to Bush Gardens for the day, you have children in a government-owned vehicle. And so that's why, you know, you just can't say, put it in one broad category. Can I transport a non-Fed? There's so many non-Feds that are in government vehicles, whether you're a visiting scientist from another country that's on a DOE lab on um, for you know two or three months, it's up to your agency to decide. So contact your agency fleet manager or general counsel's office for policy guidance. Federal Tort Claims Act, I'm gonna say that a lot today, covers federal employees in the scope of employment. So the question where the person's like, can I just drop my kid off at the daycare center? and then go to the office because they're right next door to each other. And so when you, when you drop the child off at the daycare center and then go to your office, is that within the scope of your employment? That's not for GSA to decide, but that's up for your general counsel's office to decide. Who will be liable if something has happened? Is federal employee being displaced? In other words, is it costing taxpayers more money? We get this question a lot. If, um, can a spouse accompany me if I'm going to an official dinner at night? But say you have four other people in the office who are supposed to ride with you, but you wanna bring your spouse. So is it costing taxpayers more money because you're displacing a federal employee to have the non-fed in there. Again, perception. How does it look? How's it going to look if someone shows up to an official function at night and their spouse and kids get out of the government vehicle? So somebody will be writing down that license plate number and emailing me, Eric, or Stacy the next day. What is going on? All these people piled out of a government vehicle to go have dinner. So um, that's why you should always look for guidance from your general counsel's office and look for internal policy. And if you're a fleet manager, write internal policy. And when you're writing internal policy, put examples. We love examples. And so if you need help with that, just reach out to us, vehicle.policy at gsa.gov. To go along the lines of can a non-fed drive in a government vehicle, can a contractor drive a government vehicle? There are regulations in place that do make that possible. So 41 CFR 102-34, that's motor vehicle management. And if you look at 0.21, it's about contractors driving GOVs. There is a FAR, Federal Acquisition Regulation Citation that will be in the contract for a contractor to drive a government vehicle. It's contractor use of GSA fleet vehicles. 
And then 41 CFR 101-39.202 is contractor authorized services. And remember 41 CFR 101-39 is the regulation that governs GSA fleet, which a lot is currently being rewritten. A lot of that has been put into the leasing guide, the customer leasing guide. So go look in the customer leasing guide for, uh, you can do a search for the word contractor. So considerations. When people ask me, can a contractor drive a government vehicle? I always, the first thing I tell them to look for is, has the contracting officer authorized use of a GOV for that contractor? So the contractor's on site, say he's a contract plumber. And so the contract that the government has for that plumber to be there working on site, does it authorize hemp use of a GOV? So the contracting officer should be able to answer that question for you. Does the contractor have liability insurance? And do drivers have state driver's license for applicable vehicle types? What do I mean by applicable vehicle type? So say you have a contract for a bus service and it's gonna have more than 15 passengers in that bus. So that driver if that in that state may require a commercial driver's license, a CDL. And so you always wanna make sure whatever function the contract driver is doing that it has the correct state license for the type of work they're doing. So as a federal fleet manager, what should I take into consideration when you're authorizing contractor use of government vehicles? Is it advantageous to the government? Has the contracting officer authorized it? Has the contractor provided proof of insurance and a valid state license? If using GSA fleet lease vehicles, is the contractor obtaining and paying for the vehicle directly to GSA fleet or using lease vehicles provided by the agency? Or is the contractor using an agency owned vehicle? And then as a fleet manager, you should think about, okay, you're, you're, you train your government employees. How do I educate agency drivers, federal and contractors on their responsibilities to obey state and local traffic laws? Do the agency drivers know what to do if a vehicle breaks down or is in an accident? And who do I call for questions about contractor use of GOVs and POVs in your agency? So this is just things for you to consider when you are authorizing use of a uh, contractor to use a government vehicle. Okay, so moving on, let's talk a little bit about toll management can't seem to drive anywhere, at least in Virginia and DC and Maryland, without having to pay a toll. Uh, I'm sure that's a lot across the country. Um, I live in the Hampton Roads area and you cannot cross a river <laughs> without having to pay a toll to go through a tunnel um, to get to Norfolk and um, back and forth. So, as you can imagine, in the Hanson Road, Norfolk area, we have a lot of government vehicles, and a lot of these tolls are uh, their uh, operator. There's no operators. It's, it's through the easy pass system, or they take a picture of your license plate. So lots of pictures of license plates being taken across the country of government vehicles going through tolls. So federal agencies are required to pay tolls. If you're on official travel, or if you're on local travel, it's a reimbursable expense. That's if you get to stop and pay the toll and get a receipt, but most of them are set up with uh, easy pass. There's no booth to pay. So agencies may set up accounts with easy pass or it's similar, I think in Florida, they call it a sun pass. So set up the account. Tolls are not included in GSA fleet lease rates and tolls may not be paid with the GSA fleet fuel card. The GSA Smart Pay Office is neutral on what type of card your agency decides to use to pay for tolls. Some agencies use a purchase card, some agencies use a travel card, some agencies for agency and vehicles, they do allow you to use the fuel card. But if you lease from GSA fleet, 
You can't use the fuel card to pay for toll. So just remember, the federal government does pay for tolls. You just can't drive through the tunnel and not expect to pay that toll. Um, this became uh, very popular up in the Washington, D.C. area is the use of express or hot lanes. I'm not sure what they call it in your area, but it's basically, it allows you to get in a separate lane that uh, technically will let you get from point A to point B faster, but you pay a toll or a fee to drive in that lane. So drivers do have to pay for any tolls incurred while driving a government vehicle. GSA, again, I'm reiterating the fact GSA does not regulate local travel. So this is an agency decision. Are you gonna authorize your drivers to use the express or hot lanes in a GOV? When you're doing that, some things you can think about, is this mission essential? Does it save the government time and money? And is it for the convenience of the government, not for the employee? There's a lot of vehicles that are authorized home to work you. And as someone leaves the office and they need to get home to see their child's soccer game, and they decide, oh, I'm just gonna hop on the express lane so I get home quicker to make it in time for the game, is that for the convenience of the government or the employee? So when you're writing internal policy, please take that into consideration. Give examples to your employees so they can completely understand your internal policy. And again, agency policy should also dictate whether it's the use of the purchase, travel, or fleet card, because the GSA Smart Pay Office is neutral on that. And when there, if there are a lot of express and hot lanes in your area, when you're authorizing home to work transportation, just please take into consideration the proximity of the work location to the home. Do a cost analysis. I've seen home to work determinations at some agencies where the person authorized home to work was you know, 170 miles from the office location. What, 170 miles or even 100 miles? So you need to determine as the agency fleet manager working with the office uh, with a mission to complete. So you need to work with your internal offices on what would be a good uh, factor to consider when home to work transportation. What metric are you gonna use? You know, is there a cutoff point of how far away they have to be to be authorized home to work transportation? and whether you're going to grant use of the express or hot lanes for them to get back and forth in a more timely manner. So who pays for traffic parking or toll violations? Employees are personally responsible for tickets and fines. It is not a reimbursable expense. Appropriated funds may not be used and tickets mailed to the agency must be delivered to the employee. So this is something you need to educate your drivers on. Um, agencies, because say we were talking about tolls earlier, lots of uh, fines for tolls going through when there's nobody to collect the toll and they're just taking pictures of license plates. And so those uh, fleet managers have had to be very creative in how they figure out who was driving the vehicle that day um, or who would be responsible for the violation. But just remember that employees are personally responsible for those. What is the policy on the use of handheld devices while driving a government vehicle? Um, this, you know, I think people have gotten a lot better about this throughout the last 10 years. Most states or local uh, agents, uh, localities have banned the use of handheld devices while driving, but there is an executive order geared towards government drivers uh, specifically. It's EO13513. It prohibits texting while driving a government vehicle. It 
prohibits texting in a POV if using a government furnished equipment. So if you're in a POV where you're using your government cell phone to text, don't drive. You can't do that. So your agency should have written policy about the use of handheld devices while driving a government vehicle, and you must obey all state and local laws and ordinances. I have a link at the bottom of the page that will bring up the current state and local laws about handheld devices while using a government vehicle. Yes, I get this question. Uh, can I carry a personal firearm in a government vehicle? Probably at least once a month, I get this question. And it's an agency decision. It's not something that GSA would regulate because again, this is uh, more mission related. And uh, just a reminder that 18 U.S. Code Chapter 44 on firearms, it defines the term of a firearm. The possession of firearms and dangerous weapons are prohibited in federal facilities, and you must obey all state and local laws uh, about you know carrying a personal firearm in a vehicle, not just a government vehicle, but any vehicle. So just remember that it's an agency decision. And if you're writing internal directives, uh, you might want to put this in there because I get this question more often than you would think. Okay, another good one. What about localities that have legalized marijuana? Um, think back, would GSA write a policy or a regulation that would prohibit it? No, because there are many missions in the federal government that may require someone to have marijuana in the vehicle. If you're a police officer and you've just confiscated marijuana and it has to get transported from uh, where you took it from to the police station, you would have the marijuana in the car. So if we had a regulation that prohibited it, how would he do his job? So it's agency decision, agency policy. Just please take in, when you're writing your agency policy, take into consideration that marijuana is still a Schedule I controlled substance under the Controlled Substance Act. So even if it's legal in your state, federal law says it is a controlled substance. So we get this question a lot too. Is the use of e-cigarettes allowed in government vehicles? Um, the FDA issued a final rule that took effect in 2016 that defined e-cigarettes as tobacco products. So the use of electronic alternatives that produce nicotine or other vapors is also prohibited in federally owned and leased buildings. Agencies should write internal policies on the prohibited use of tobacco products in federal vehicles to include electronic alternatives that produce nicotine or other vapor. So it's for you to write agency policy on. If you lease from GSA fleet, then you already know that they prohibit that in their lease the vehicle because they're trying to maximize sale value because you know a vehicle that's been smoked in, our vape then may bring, uh, uh, cause damage to the vehicle. And so GSA fleet, because they're the owner of the vehicle can prohibit the use of it. But if you have agency owned vehicles or commercially leased vehicles, then we ask that you write your own internal guidance to prohibit the use of tobacco products and e-cigarettes because that is considered a tobacco product now. So let's talk, uh, I guess this was big a year or two ago, electronic logging devices. Those that have um, trucks and trailers and uh, heavy equipment um, asked about, what about ELDs? So the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration issued regulations that were requiring um, certain drivers of heavy equipment to use electronic logging devices, ELDs. And so we reached out to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration and asked them, hey, what about government vehicles? So this is a distinction. 
a federally owned and operated vehicle are not subject to the federal motor carrier safety regulations. They're exempt from medical requirements and hours of service government because they're not considered in commerce because it's government owned vehicles with federal people driving them. But the big but, if you have a contractor operating a government vehicle, they are subject to the federal motor carrier safety regulations. So that's about as much as I know about that. And I have a contact down here with Department of Transportation, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, Bill. Bill would be happy to answer your questions on this subject. I get this question every few weeks actually, is if a contractor is driving a government vehicle, do we need a DOT number? Do we need electronic logging device? And uh, if the contractor is driving the vehicle, the answer is the, uh, what about insurance? Um, it's a longstanding policy of the government to self-insure its own risk or loss. The Federal Torts Claims Act, I've mentioned that a few times today, it protects federal employees from personal liability while acting within the scope of their employment to accomplish their agency's mission. So yes, you may be personally liable for an accident if you are found to be operating the vehicle outside the scope of your employment. All tort claims are automatically transferred to the Justice Department. Don't assume your agency has you covered. So if you look under the desktop workshop, you're going to see a personal liability workshop. I highly suggest you go watch a recorded version of that because it will dive deeper into the insurance subject and your personal liability. Uh, GSA fleet has done a great job with that. So I'm just giving you a little bit of information um, on that. Lots of lots of questions uh, a couple of years ago about the OF346. Do we have a government driver's license? Who issues government driver's license? Well, the uh, optional form 346 was called the U.S. Government Motor Vehicle Identification Card. It used to be a form that was managed by OPM, but they transferred it to GSA years ago, and we don't know why. But because the form had no sponsoring agency, it was canceled in June of 2020. So when it was canceled, a lot of people were like, wait, we use that form a lot. So our fabulous GSA forms office worked and worked and worked in coordination with o OGT to help find a sponsor for the form. And um, they were able to find Department of Defense wanted to sponsor the form. So the form was reinstated. They just put a new link up within the last six months since Fed Fleet training. Um, you can actually download the PDF of the form, and I have the link on the presentation. Uh, it's a PDF version of the Optional Form 346. So if your agency uses these, U.S. Government Motor Vehicle Identification Card, it is being uh, sponsored by DOD. At the same time, I don't have this on the slide, but DOD took ownership of optional form 345. And optional form 345 is physical fitness to drive a government vehicle. I forgot the exact name of the form, but the optional form 345, DOD has it, but they have not completed the update on it yet. But if you stay in touch with DOD, and I have an email address on the slide, they will get that to you as soon as they have it ready to go. Home to work transportation. So we're just gonna keep moving along. I always say I'm gonna have time for questions at the end, but I always have a lot of information to talk about. I think maybe I will work with GSA fleet so that we can do just a webinar on home to work transportation. So home to work transportation, that's when you drive a government vehicle home, right? So home to work for employees is generally not allowed. Not allowed. It's not a right. I deserve it. Oh, it's just so much easier. 
nope, it's in law, it's in regulations, generally not allowed. Employees may be approved home to work by the head of the agency. The head of my division? Nope. The head of my region? Nope. The head of my bureau? Nope. The head of your agency. So if you work for Department of Transportation, Secretary of Transportation has to approve it. At GSA, it's the administrator of GSA has to approve it. Um, they don't take these determinations lightly in agencies. The head of the agency has to approve it. There are different types of home to work determinations, uh, field work, clear and present danger, compelling operational consideration, emergency, are approved by a person or specific job position. So I know it may not be current now, but in the past, we had these quality inspectors at GSA. And instead of listing out every person who was a quality inspector, they just used the job series for the determination. So just remember, approval may not be delegated. There's a definition for field work, which means official work requiring employees' presence at various locations other than his or her regular place of work um, to get home to work determinations done. Uh, home to work not covered. If you are an official travel, the home to work transportation regulation does not apply to you. Remember, we talked about that earlier. Can I take number of vehicle homes that prior to the night of travel? Um, it's because home to work transportation regulation does not apply to that. Uh, permanent change of duty station doesn't apply. And then employees who are essential for safe and efficient performance of intelligence, counterintelligence, protective services, or criminal law enforcement duties when designated in writing, such as the head of their agency. Oh, wait, so I'm using legal language here. Does that mean if I'm law enforcement, I can take my vehicle home? Nope, did you see? And you must be designated and writing as such by your agency. So you may not need the official determination, but you do need to be designated to, in writing by the head of your agency to be able to take government vehicle home. Home to work transportation, virtual workers telework. Oh, so complicated. Each agency handles virtual workers a little different with regards to home to work transportation. At GSA, basically all of us, most of us have been working from home since the pandemic started. So how are we handling having to have a government vehicle, but we're all working from home? It's very complicated. You need to contact your agency general counsel's office for uh, assistance on this issue. Um, just remember, there's always an option to park at an alternate location, such as a local post office or a nearby federal facility. And um, what's the hottest topic right now in the home to work transportation? Home to work virtual workers and EVs. Oh my, stay tuned. Some guidance uh, is being considered on how are we going to charge all of these EVs at home with all of these virtual workers. So stay tuned for guidance on that. I'm running out of time, but I just want to get through these last few slides. So I talked about this earlier. What does the uh, federal travel regulation have to do with government vehicles? It defines the methods of transportation that you are allowed to authorize for official travel. So the question I usually get a lot is, how many miles can I drive a government vehicle in one day? I don't know. How many miles can you drive a government vehicle in one day? So basically, people want to take a government vehicle and drive for eight hours. Is it, is it official travel orders? Have the most advantageous mode of transportation been selected? If this is official travel and you're driving for eight hours, but it's cheaper to take an airplane, that's when the federal travel, travel regulation kicks in. So just remember, driver fatigue is not regulated by GSA. And um, if it's local travel, um, is it multiple stops during the day? So you're driving from stop to stop to stop. Again, that's agency policy because GSA does not regulate local travel. So this is why I always bring this up because I get this question probably sometimes at least once a week, how many miles can I drive a government vehicle in one day? And um, if it's official travel, you have to use the most advantageous mode of transportation to do uh, that trip. 
Okay, I, I want to remind you that I'm looking for pictures. Thank you to my contact at Yellowstone. I have lots of great pictures of vehicles in action at Yellowstone, but show me your vehicles in action. Cool things in fleet management, vehicle.policy at gsa.gov. Please email a picture of your vehicle in action. And so that's all I have today. Um, if you need additional information, you can always email me at vehicle.policy at gsa.gov. And I think Eric has been doing a great job answering questions. If a federal employee drives a 28 passenger bus on state highway for return to GSA, is the vehicle operator required to have a CDL? I would say, Patricia, to please check with your FSR on that. I do not know the answer to that. Um, so I would coordinate that with your FSR. If you lease from GSA fleet, please know who your FSR is. And if you don't know who your FSR is, it's at www.gsa.gov backslash FSR. So thank you. For attending today. Stacey, any last minute announcements? No, just keep an eye on our desktop workshop website um, for upcoming sessions. We do have, um, for those of you with agency owned vehicles, in October, there is going to be a session about um, the new slash replacement for FMVRS. And then looking into November and December um, for leasing customers, we'll be getting into the CAM kickoff in November. And then for all customers, um, you know, vehicle offerings and all of the great information um, that we put out there on what vehicles are available and on contract to, uh, to purchase or lease. So definitely keep an eye on that website. Um, I think we'll stick around and just see if there were any last minute yeah. um, questions that come in. And yes, Gary, there is a date for that session. And I thought I had the website up, but I must have- I think it's October 19th. Does that sound like, right? I feel like I've scheduled so many of these recently <laughs> that I don't trust. Yes, but you're right, October 19th at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time is the the vehicle registration functionality in the news system. And um, I just want to say, because I've been getting emails about it, what did you call it? GSAfleet.gov vehicle functionality. Yeah, um, that's, that's FMVRS. Did I say it wrong? No, I think you got it right. It's a mouthful for sure. Yes, but that is F, the, new, the new FMVRS. So we'll be saying that acronym for at least the next 10 years because we can't remember <laughs> not to call it FMVRS, but it's FMVRS. And so who else? Can you verify the time slots for the CAM kickoff? That I can. So November 10th at 2 p.m. and November 16th at 11 a.m. And those are both Eastern time as well. Um, you can pretty much bet on the fact that our times will be listed in Eastern. We always do indicate that, but our headquarters team is on the Eastern time zone. And so we're the ones doing the scheduling. So they get posted in Eastern time. Right, so you, what is that website again? So you download the presentation from gsa.gov, right, gsa-fleet-training? Correct. And it's in the chat box where you download the website. A lot of people keep asking, that's where you download the presentation. Here, I'll pop it in there again in case anybody joined after we posted it, but it's in so the somebody, chat. Go ahead. And uh, somebody, somebody said, go, <laughs> Stacey. Oh, we've got delays. Um, somebody did ask a question and I did answer them with it. So it's also in the Q&A box. Unfortunately, we can't just post messages in there. Um, 
So somebody asked, can federal employees use other agency vehicles? Example, DOD able to use Department of State government vehicles. That's an agency decision. And if you have an interagency agreement, that's something you would need to figure out because uh, liability is always an issue. Oh, how do you know what? How can I contact to get on the distribution list? Um, it, can't they sign up for notifications at that same website, Stacey? Yes, you can. Um, and in the upper right hand corner, there's a, it says GSA fleet training email sign up. You should just be able to plug in your information. Um, we use Gov Delivery. Um, some of you may be familiar with that. Some of you may not, but a lot of agencies use that. Um, and it's sort of like a subscription service and you can manage what notifications you get. Um, so when you plug that in, I don't know if if when you enter in your email, if that's going to take you directly to ours or if it's the overall GSA one, but then any of our emails that come out from that should have an option to like update your subscriptions and you should be able to see what all the options are there. And click them all. <laughs> I like to get all the notifications from GSA fleet, especially like they have a newsletter and a customer letter. So this is electric drive week that sort of thing. So somebody asked, any idea on microchips for new vehicles? I'm not sure what they mean by microchips, but GSA fleet does have a um, geotab. What is geotab? I'm Tele actually wondering if they're, if, yeah, I was wondering if they were asking just chip shortages in general for vehicles. Um, oh, I forgot about that. So I think, um, I think in one of your newsletters for GSA fleet, you guys addressed uh, if vehicles were going to be late because of microchip. Um, I'm sure we did. And I'm sure at this point it's old. <laughs> right. Um, but I can say, yes, there are delivery delays across the board. Um, and at this point, because the the chip shortages haven't resolved themselves. We don't have a timeline. Manufacturers don't have a timeline for when that's going to be resolved. So, I mean, reach order, out to your FSR. Yeah, I mean, and they're probably not going to have a whole lot of great information, to be honest with you, because it's. I don't think the manufacturers have a great sense of when they are coming in, um, and then you know what allocations they do get, exactly where are they shipping those and what's going on. I, I don't envy their situation right now. Um, so we ask everybody to have have some patience and give us some some grace. Uh, you know, as we have information and know things, it'll certainly be communicated, but just don't be shocked if, um, if you reach out to your FSR about a specific order, if they can't give you a a timeline it's pretty crazy um we were hoping by now that things would start to go back to normal that doesn't seem to be the case and at this point i don't think anybody's predicting when it will sort of go back to a normal pace um and i did see somebody that asked about verifying the time on the cam kickoff for october 16th there is an error on the registration. That session is at 11 a.m. Thank you for pointing that out. I will take care and get that fixed here, if not this afternoon, first thing tomorrow morning. So I appreciate that. And uh, then the questions from Susan, I can you just, who should she email those to? I mean, I can, yeah, you have FY20 vehicles that haven't delivered. That's not totally shocking at this point, um, not knowing what vehicle types, there's certain vehicle types that I would um, find that more normal of than, than others, but I'm unfortunately not that plugged into what's going on with those orders. Um, as far as the adv an advantage of consolidating your vehicles, I mean, that, that kind of goes beyond just how soon can you get the new vehicle? It also comes down to, well, can you afford to replace the vehicles on your own? Um, 
or you know, are you not getting the funding for that? So at least by consolidating now, you're into our replacement cycle. While the vehicles may take a, a little bit longer or a lot a bit longer to come in, at least you're in there, you're in the mix, things have been ordered. And you're right, um, John DePasqual with headquarters would be the better person to talk to about consolidations. Um, you know, they can talk to their FSR about the specific vehicles and see if they do have any updates. There might be some instances where they do and some they might not. It's it's all going to be pretty hit and miss from that standpoint, just because of it's all because of the chip shortages is why those delays are there. And and like I said, nobody has a real sense on when that's going to resolve and, and let up. So, but on the other side of things, if you were to have placed the orders as agency owned vehicles, you're going to have the same issue. It's not just on the leasing side, the same thing, the same delivery and supply issues are hitting the purchasing and leasing side. It's the exact same thing. I mean, it's hitting the, the private sector as well. You, know, you see people all the time talking about they're trying to buy a new vehicle and you know there's tags on the vehicles that say it's there's a markup of 10 and 12,000 dollars because the supply is just so short and the main and the dealers can do that and it's also how they're able to keep their doors open and pay their employees since they can't sell the same number of vehicles they usually would it's 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 lasted a lot longer than anybody thought and anybody hoped and we all want it to be resolved as soon as is possible and yesterday will would have been better than you know tomorrow so we'll provide the information that we can and certainly talk to your fsrs and any other points of contact you have at gsa to try to get information on specific orders but just have some understanding that there is very little we can do about it at this point i wish i had something better to say on that and where do they get their certificate for attending today? That'll be emailed out maybe this afternoon, if not this afternoon, tomorrow morning. Um, along with that certificate, there will be a link to our desktop workshop website where you can download the slides, um, register for other sessions. So if anybody missed that link or you thought you grabbed it and you find you don't, it'll be included in that email as well. All right, I think we're good. Well, thanks right. for attending today, everyone. Yes, thank you. And Susan, I would talk with John about that. Um, again, I'm not the right person to really get in to those questions and I don't wanna steer you in any wrong direction. So if, you, if you're in contact with John regarding consolidating, um, that would be the best person to talk to. So, all right, with that, we are gonna close everything out. We appreciate everyone's time today and all of the great questions. And thank you to Connie and Eric for your time and putting on an awesome session. Um, take care everyone and stay safe out there.